Do you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I chose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Please be seated. I want to just for a moment bring you cool greetings from Neshota House in Wisconsin. We don't know how you do this down here. And in three months, you're not going to know how we do what we do up there. Uh, it's great to be with the folks from Epiphany today. It's been a, a wonderful visit, and we thank you for your hospitality. I have to say, would you please forgive us for our inhospitality in that we have to catch a plane right after the service, and we're going to run off, and that doesn't mean we're unfriendly. It just means we're planning to get home. Uh, my wife, Dawn, is out there toward the back, and that's probably about all you can see of her this visit, um, as we'll be departing quickly. We, uh, Church of the Epiphany is known to us by your reputation, uh, recently through Father Ignacio Gama, who was your curate and uh, a wonderful priest who's, of course, been called away to St. Luke's. Uh, as uh, Father Michel said, he taught for us at a very critical time, including COVID, and continues to be a mentor for our students and especially for some of our graduates, not least my own son-in-law, who's a priest that was ordained in the Diocese of Dallas. And uh, they take his advice, and when they do, they find it to be very wise. Um, and I, I mentioned that uh, I saw Canon Betsy not that long ago, and she's well occupied in doing good work up in Oklahoma. So we know you perish by reputation, and it's good finally to be here among you. Thank you for your kind welcome. That's not fair. That was the constant refrain from the playgrounds and backyards of my childhood. That's not fair. One of the consistent features of unsupervised children playing is that we were always left to interpret and make up and sometimes change the rules right in the middle of a game. This is where we learned to negotiate and compromise uh, and to manage conflict. It was actually probably a good thing for us. But it was not unusual to spend more time arguing about the rules than actually playing the game, whatever those rules or that game might have been. In my backyard, we managed to have an entire baseball games with no more than three kids. Now that's not easy, since it required one of us to be one team and another of us to be the other team and the third fellow to be the full-time pitcher. Then of course, and this is the key, you had to have an endless supply of invisible runners. And if you don't know what an invisible runner is, it's because you played in leagues and not in backyards. But invisible runners, you know, would take you, you, you hit the ball, you make it to first base, you've got to bat again because there's nobody else to do it, and so you have invisible runner on first base. Now, even in the era of slow motion instant replay, it is very hard to umpire when it concerns invisible runners. It's hard to know when they're safe, it's hard to know when they're out, and for us, this always led to endless arguments. He was not safe. No, he was safe. Because you should be able to score from second on a single. 
not an infield single, <laughs> and so on and so forth. We could get so mad at each other that, you know, we would protest finally, I, I'm never going to play with you again. And we'd all go to our respective homes, and an hour, maybe an hour and a half later, one of us would show up on the other doorstep and say, can Roy come out and play? And we'd come back to my yard, and <clears throat> we'd play football with three people, which is not, actually, is actually a little easier. One full-time quarterback and two teams, also known as a receiver. Well, that was my childhood, and we loved every minute of it. And enough with nostalgia. The point is that we have this implanted sense for some kind of fairness, and children catch on to it very, very quickly. And when the world turns unfair, especially when it seems unfair to us, we protest. And we might take our toys and go home and just quit playing. We just know something isn't right. That, of course, reminds us of this parable that we have read today. When you saw that these laborers were getting paid equally for very unequal work, you probably thought to yourself, that's not fair. Maybe because it is in the Bible or because Jesus told the story, you thought that you should make some kind of spiritual sense of it. But it is likely that your sense of what, that what happened there was not fair is still lurking in the background, never mind the spiritual sense. You might still feel that way by the end of this sermon. It is, if that is our reaction to hearing the story, I want you to imagine if you were one of the workers in the story. To be a day laborer was a precarious existence. One might think today of a migrant worker, though with less mobility, less guaranteed work, and even less protection under the law. One strong way to put it that remains true is that a day laborer might aspire to become a slave. After all, an owner has an investment in a slave that he doesn't have in a day laborer, and the life sustenance was at least dependable. It is estimated that a healthy and ambitious day laborer could perhaps find 200 days of work a year. And at a denarius a day, that's a, the customary daily wage that we read of, he could provide a kind of subsistence lifestyle. No extras, mind you, no hope of saving up and someday purchasing your own land. Um, you could get by, especially if your wife and children could find work of one kind or another, but they at best, all of them together, could make only a fraction of what a pittance dad could make, but they had to do it nonetheless. It's always hard to make monetary equivalences from 21st century North America to the first century, but let's just say for argument's sake that this subsistence wage was, say, 50 cents or a dollar an hour in our terms. Just think about that. Now, can you imagine yourself at 6 a.m. beating the sunrise to find yourself at the front of the line in the village center where the hiring got done? And perhaps that morning, as you stand there, your wife is calling upon Jehovah God, Jehovah Jireh, the provider God, to show favor to the poor as he promised that he does in his scriptures. Indeed, the Old Testament demands that wage payers pay their day laborers in full at the end of every day. The law demands it and the prophets reinforce it. And the reason is not hard to seek. Because the money, its presence or absent, absence, might be the difference between having food tomorrow or not. Indeed, the Lord's Prayer says, Give us this day our daily bread, which can be translated from the Greek quite appropriately as, Give us today the bread for tomorrow. That, for a day laborer, would be the good life. To know that when you go to bed, that you will eat tomorrow. It's not an easy existence. All of that to say that it was a happy morning for this day laborer who was selected for a full day's work. 
And unlike some, it seems that this landowner, evidently a good one, promised in advance the wage that they would have hoped for, a full denarius. And so the story goes. Over the course of the day, you see others come to join you in the field, and you don't think very much of it. You've seen this before. When a manager adds people to the workforce through the day, you know what he is doing. After all, if he hires too many all-day workers at the beginning of the day, he may have spent too much on labor for the day's task and even send you home early, having overspent. But by adding labor over the course of the day, he is doing his job cleverly and appropriately. You'll notice it is only the workers who started at the crack of dawn who were told how much they were going to get paid. Everybody else was told that they would get what was fair. Now remember, you haven't read this story. You're living this story. You've seen this before. You know what is happening. The manager is shrewd. He's keeping his costs down. And at least you have a guarantee for what's coming. The long day of work will be worth it. That's all fine and good until we come to the end of this 12-hour workday. Then it comes time to be paid. One can only imagine what it must have felt like to see those who had only worked one hour get paid a full denarius. I imagine there might have been two reactions, perhaps simultaneously. Wait a minute. He's paying them what he promised to pay us? That's not fair. Or, wait a minute. If he's paying them a denarius for only one hour of work, could I be getting 12? And he just doesn't know how he should feel. Is he trembling with anger at the injustice? Or trembling in anticipation of the kind of money that he has never before in his life seen? You couldn't blame him for getting his hopes up. His mind fantasizes about going home to his wife and kids. Honey, you're not going to believe what happened today. He will show her the coins, and together they'll weep with joy. This kind of thing doesn't happen for people like us. Praise Jehovah. Man, that would have been a good story. Of course, it doesn't go that way. It would have been a great story if it had gone that way. And it would teach us, like all good moralistic fables, that hard work pays off in the end. We would use it in Sunday school <laughs> for our kids. Or there's another way the story could have gone. The manager could have just paid the 12-hour workers what he had promised, hmm? sent them away, none the wiser, and then kept paying each group a full denarius and then send them away in turn. Then we would have a great story about the generosity of God who gives people more than they deserve, but no one would have had to witness what looks like a pure injustice. But that's not the story we have either. Fearing the worst and hoping for the best, the last group of workers well, they get exactly what they were promised. One stinking, no good, you've got to be kidding, denarius. That's it. It's not fair. Now, if we say to ourselves that we wouldn't react that way, it is probably because we have never been a day laborer whose hopes were crushed, or because we feel obliged to take spiritual lessons from the story. Well, of course we should, but only if we understand that this is not a story about fairness, but a story about generosity. It turns out that the owner isn't cutting costs. He's employing unworthy people. It's not what we thought it was. It's not a story about fairness, but a story about generosity. It's not a story about fairness, but a story about envy in the face of generosity. 
Ultimately, this is a story to explain the story of Jesus himself. Over and over again, Jesus reaches to undeserving persons with an endless supply of God's grace and mercy. Tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, the irreligious, and the blasphemers. He eats with them. He is in their homes. He does not refuse, but rather seeks their company. And the 12-hour workers, scribes, Pharisees, religious people, are watching this with unbelief and dismay. They are the older son, and these riffraff are their wayward, undeserving younger brothers. It's not fair. And that's exactly the point. It's not fair. God's generosity is not fair. Thank God, as it pertains to his grace, kindness, and mercy, God is not fair. No, not fair. Rather, as the psalmist says, the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting. Now, we might think that we are ourselves all day workers. I mean, here you are on a Sunday morning, you could be doing other things, but here you are in church. We might think that we are all day workers, but let's not kid ourselves. We are all last hour workers. We're all 11th hour employees, and our work is not deserving of the pay. The question for us is, can we see the heart of God through the actions of Jesus, who is chasing down one lost sheep, overturning a household for one lost coin, and preparing a banquet for one scandalous prodigal son. If we can see the heart of God through the actions of Jesus, then we too can share his heart. If we see his heart and share his heart, we will give up on the project of making ourselves deserving and take up the project of showing and telling other unworthy persons just like us, that there is an absurdly generous God who wants to give also to them way more than they deserve. You see, it's not about my denarius. It's about his generosity. It's not about my labor. It's about his grace. It's not even about me. It's about him. And he is all about them. And if I would be all about him, I would be all about them. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find it on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. 
He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people can be found on uh, Book of Common Prayer on page 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others, especially John Gibson, Pat Bell, and those we now name. We pray for the repose of the soul of those who have died, especially Sam Hicks, and Marjorie McPherson. Collect for the election of a rector. You'll find it on page 8 in your worship leaflet. Almighty God, giver of every good gift, look graciously on your church, and so guide the minds of those who shall call for this parish, that we may receive a faithful pastor, who will care for your people and equip us for our ministries. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Turning to page 360 in your Book of Common Prayer, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand as we share the peace with one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Again, we welcome you to the Church of the Epiphany, and we uh, thank you, Dr. Anderson, for your word, for Dawn, for your being Dawn. We're somewhat 
So thank you for coming and sharing this time with us. Uh, if you are new to Epiphany, if you have been away for a while and are returning and want to connect with Epiphany, we would like to connect with you. You can do that one of three ways. You can get the visitor's card in the pew pocket in front of you or to the, to the side and fill that out and put it in the alms basin, or you can go to the QR code on the first full page of our worship leaflet and take a picture of that and follow that into realms of Epiphany, or you can just come to me and say, uh, Ken and Neil, I'd like to uh, connect. Uh, here's my telephone number, and I'll return that call and connect with you. So please do that. Also, uh, we have an upgrade update on the progress, progressive dinner. We were going to have it in another week, and we discovered that Network, our community uh, association that cares for the poor and the needy and, and whatnot, they're having their fundraiser that evening, and we are very heavily involved in network, and so we defer to them, and we will reschedule our progressive dinner for another time. Also, if you desire prayers for healing, uh, please come forward at the end of the, the church service. Come to this, this side of the communion rail, and one of the priests will pray with you, and if you wish to help lay on the hands for prayer, for, for healing, uh, please come forward as well. Finally, we do uh, welcome all people to receive the uh, com Holy Communion at Epiphany. And if you are new to Epiphany, this is how you'll receive. Come forward to the communion rail and either kneel or stand as is most comfortable for you. Place your hands in the sign of the cross and the priest will place a wafer in your hand and you may then consume it then the chalice bearer will come by and grasp that chalice by the base and take a sip of the wine should you choose not to receive wine today place your hands over your chest of the sign of the cross and uh, and we will pass on from you or should you choose not to receive communion we still have a blessing for you a, the priest will give you a blessing place your hands over your chest and the priest will give you a blessing uh, if you have need of gluten-free wafer then we have that available as well come toward the end of the receiving of communion put one hand over your chest and that will be a note to the priest and uh, father uh, Deacon Dave will come and serve you communion with a gluten-free wafer. And so walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
we continue with Eucharistic Prayer A, which you'll find on page 361 in the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption of the Father in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Alleluia. Oh, go ahead. of God for the dearly beloved people of God. <laughs> 